Hey guys, welcome back to our CCNA series. In today's topic, we're going to talk about the communication model. So before we really deep dive into the network, we need to understand some of the fundamentals behind how the communication between two hosts works or what are the different type of reference model that are being used in networking, how the peer-to-peer -peer communication works, how the data is being encapsulated and de-encapsulated. So these are the some of the things that we are going to decode in this particular episode. So let's understand the very first thing, what is host-to-host -host communication. So in the previous video, we had kind of learned over that host-to-host -host communication or the host are the endpoints within your network. We primarily call them the host or the endpoint. So that's what we're going to take a look at the how to the how the host to host communication really works. So there are two types of model that are being utilized or used for any type of host to host communication. One is called the older model, which a lot of people also call as a proprietary model. As the name says the proprietary model, that means the software is being controlled by one vendor. That means if you go ahead and use another vendor, there is no guarantee that this host or this endpoint will be able to communicate because that software is being controlled by one vendor and other vendor might not be implementing or using the same software. That's where we had the another type of model that came to the life that was your standard based model. As the name kind of indicates the standard based model, that means there were some standard being involved and the whole idea behind the standard based model was to have a multi vendor software. That means the software is not tied to one particular vendor. You can buy two endpoints from two different vendors and they will still be able to communicate. That was the whole idea behind the multi-vendor software. There were a couple of the example of the multi-vendor software of the model or the OSI model or the TCP IP model. If I have to quickly talk about the standard based, which is also called the layered model, has certain benefit or provide you know certain advantages over the proprietary obviously the first and foremost is reducing the complexity by breaking your network communication into smaller and simpler part and we're going to go ahead and see that how that really works the another thing they do is the standardizing the network components where you can have different vendors can provide the solution for each separate layer and we'll go ahead and take a look at that also they also simplify the learning about the how do you work with some of the different component. Another important aspect is they are ensuring that your components or the endpoints or devices are interoperable and you can communicate between different type of devices. And the two examples of the standard based model that we're going to take a look at are the TCP IP and the OSI model. So let's go ahead and quickly jump into the one of the standard based model, which is an OSI model. As the name says, the OSI model. So to, if I have to read this, the reason behind the OSI model or the standard based model to address the problem of networks being incompatible and unable to communicate with each other, because that was the case when we had the older model or the proprietary software, where if you have a endpoint from two different vendors, they were not able to communicate or there were some challenges and that's the reason the standard weight model came where the, to address the problem of network being incompatible and unable to communicate with each other the iso so iso stands for international organization for standardization they created a model basically to serve as a framework on which to build a suite of open system protocols so they kind of created a framework and gave it to the vendor saying, okay, hey guys, you know, you take this framework and you can build your things around this particular framework. And to build that, they use a terminology called protocols. So protocol is a set of rules that governs communication that kind of dictates, okay, how do you communicate with each other? And the whole idea or the whole vision behind this development was to make sure we get away from the proprietary system. And that's how the OSI model came to the life. And the OSI model, again, OSI stands for Open System Interconnect Reference Model. And this model was developed by ISO and ITU-T. These were the two organizations that came together and created this particular model. So the OSI reference model 
provides a means basically of describing how your data needs to be transmitted over a network. And to address this, the OSI or the ISO kind of divided this whole thing into a form of multiple layers. And they created different layers. So basically the separation of these networking functions is called layering. And as you can see in the OSI model, there are seven layers. At the bottom of the layer, we have this physical layer. The second layer or on top of the physical layer, we have a data link layer, followed by a network layer, which is your layer three. We have a transport layer, which is layer number four. We have a session layer, which is layer number five. There is a presentation layer, number six, and there is an application layer, number seven. So the whole OSI model has kind of, you know, divided into two layers, and there are total seven layers. With each layer is responsible for some particular work. If we have to go and talk about the physical layer, like as the name says, the physical layer defines the certain specification. If I have to go with the specific, like, okay, what are the mechanical, functional, and electrical things? So these specifications are needed for like activating, maintaining, and deactivating the physical link between the end devices. The physical link also enables the bit transmission because this is a physical level. So we are dealing with bits and bytes here. So the bit transmission between the devices happens at this particular layer. There are another, there are few other things that happens at this particular layer, like the timings of the voltage change, the physical data rate, the maximum transmission distance that you can use when you are using one particular type of physical medium versus the other type of physical medium. So all of these things that deal with the physical aspect are happens at the physical layer, which is your layer one. After physical layer, we have another layer, which is called your data link layer. So this is our layer two. So the data link layer defines how the data needs to be formatted for transmission and how access to physical media needs to be controlled. This layer typically includes error detection and correction. So there are a couple things that really happens at this layer. So this layer is responsible for formatting the data before transmission. And this layer also provides a way to connect to the physical medium. This layer also has a capability for the error detection and error correction. And we're going to go ahead and see some of the things later in the detail. Followed by data link layer, we have the third layer, which is your network layer, which is your layer three. A lot of people also call it as a layer three. So when somebody says layer three, that means they are referencing or they are talking about the network layer. So the network layer provides connectivity and path selection. So the important thing needs to understand it provides a connectivity as well as a path selection between two or more host systems that could be located locally or they could be geographically uh, separated. So that's the whole idea behind the layer three. So as the network continue to grow, the layer three plays a very important role. And that's what we're going to go ahead and see when uh, during later on some of the hands-on exercise. Followed by the layer three, we have a layer four, which is called as your transport layer. As the name says transport, something who is responsible for transporting the data from one place to the another place. So the transport layer defines services to segment, transfers and reassemble the data for individual communication between the end devices. So at this layer, we have, there are two protocols and we have learned the protocol is a set of rules that governs the communication between two endpoints, basically. So the two protocol that works at this layer are called TCP and another one is called UDP. And we're going to go ahead and learn about these two protocol later on in more detail. So at this layer, there are two protocol TCP and UDP. This layer is responsible for transporting your segments primarily. And this layer is on top of your transport layer. After transport layer, we have something called layer number five, which is your session layer. So as the name says, session, some, this is layer is responsible for establishing, managing, creating and terminating the sessions between two communication hosts primarily. So the session layer also synchronize the dialogue between this layer the session layer and the above layer, which is your presentation layer. And again, we're going to go ahead and see some of these things later in more detail. Followed by the session layer, we have something called presentation layer. The presentation layer ensures that the information that is sent at the application layer of one system is readable by the application layer of another system. 
So the whole idea, the use of or the responsibility of the presentation layer, it makes sure that information that is being sent between two systems should be readable by one or the other system. And that's the whole thing taken care by the presentation layer. The presentation layer has to translate among multiple data formats. So that's another thing the presentation layer does. It takes the data from different format and it converts into a common format that can be understood by the by your application. And last but not the least is your application layer. This application layer is the closest to the human basically or to the user. This is the application layer that we interact with. Let's say when you go to your browser, when you're interacting, you are using the layer seven or the application layer. So this layer provide network services to the application. Like when you are trying to do an email or when you are trying to transfer a file or when you are trying to simply browse. So the application layer establishes the availability of intended communication partners. And this is the layer which is closest to the human. So these are the seven layer that kind of makes up the whole OSI model. And the OSI model is one of the standard based model that was created or designed or, you know, uh, came into the existence just to get away from the proprietary, which were locked to one particular vendor. The another type of model that came into the existence with the OSI was the TCPA, but it was not a model. It was simply a suite of protocol. So suite means more than one. So it was a suite of protocol. So the TCP IP stands for transmission control protocol and IP stands for internet protocol. A lot of people just simply call this TCP IP protocol as in simply IP stack. If you hear somebody saying IP stack, that means they are talking about the TCP IP. And the idea behind the TCP IP defines how device should be connected over the internet. And the most important part, how data should be transmitted between those devices. That's the whole responsibility of TCP IP. And as we talked about TCP and IP, these are two protocols. There's not one protocol, these are two protocol. But so often people think them as a single protocol. So we need to understand that TCP, as we talked earlier in the OSI slide, TCP operates as the layer four, and the layer four is the transport layer. While your IP operates at the layer three, so layer three is our network layer. So the TCP operates as layer four while the IP operates at the layer three and it's responsible. So the layer four is responsible for making sure the data that the source device send arrive at its destination for transportation and IP is responsible for the transmission of data. So there is no correction or anything happens. If you remember the error correction happens at the data link layer. So TCP IP reference model is similar to the OSI model. But there is a difference between the OSI and TCP IP. In OSI reference model, there were seven layers, there are, there are seven layers. While in the TCP IP stack or TCP IP protocol suite or simply in the IP stack, there are only four layers. And if we have to map the OSI layers with the TCP IP stack layer, that's how we're going to map. So in the case of OSI model, these were the names. But in case of TCP IP stack, the name of the layer, the first layer is the link layer, followed by the internet layer, transport layer and the application layer. So in the OSI model, the physical and data link layers map to the link layer on the TCP IP stack. The network layer, which is a layer three of, on the OSI model, maps to the internet layer on the TCP IP stack. The transport layer on the OSI reference model maps to the transport layer on the TCP IP stack. The rest of the three layers, the session, presentation and application on the OSI reference model maps to the application model onto the TCP IP stack. And in terms of the functionality, these layers pretty much do the same work that we kind of saw during the OSI reference model. So link layer, this layer is also known as the network access layer. A lot of people call this link layer as network access layer. And this layer, as you say, it's equivalent to your physical and data link layer on the OSI side. While if you take a look at the internet layer, this is also with the layer three on the OSI model. A lot of people just simply call it a network layer. So this layer routes data from the source to the destination. And at this layer, the data is seen in the form of the packets. And we're going to go ahead and see some of the things. After internet layer, there is something called transport layer. So this aligns with the layer four on the OSI model. 
So this layer is the core of the TCP IP structure. This is the core one of the core layers because TCP, remember the TCP and UDP operates at the transport layer. And that's what we are talking here. So this layer is the core of your TCP IP. It is the layer where TCP and UDP really operates. And this layer is responsible for providing communication services directly to the application process that are running on your host primarily. And then we have this application layer. This application layer corresponds to the session presentation and application on the OSI reference model. So again, this layer is the one which is closest to the humans. So this layer application for like file transfer and some of the other things. So this makes up your TCP IP protocol suite. Now we kind of know, okay, hey, there are standard based protocols. Now we need to see using the standard based protocol, how these two devices or two endpoints really communicates with each other. And that's where, where our peer to peer communication comes into the picture. So we kind of know that in the network, these devices are sometimes called as endpoints also host also. So when we say the term peer, peer means somebody who is equal the same so therefore now in terms of peer-to-peer -peer communication we are saying the communication between of the two equal types so in if i have to put simply each layer must be able to communicate with its peer on the other side so that's the whole idea so now if you take a look at uh, this diagram or let's quickly go ahead and read uh, this in more clarity. The term peer means the equal of a person or object. Therefore, peer-to-peer -peer communication means communication between equal. In other words, each layer must be able to communicate with its peer on the other side. So each source layer must be able to communicate with its corresponding destination layer. Now, during the process of peer-to-peer -peer communication, the protocols, again, protocol is a set of rules, at each layer exchange packets between peer layers. These packet of informations are called PDUs. When one device or one peer talks to this other peer, they kind of, these packets, they share, they send some packets and these packets are called PDUs, which are protocol data units. And each stage of the process, a PDU has a different name. So if you take a look at exam, this particular example, where these two peers, so we, in this peer, we have a sender and there's a receiver. So the P sender wants to send something to the receiver. So now there are four layers. If you can see, there's an application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and link layer. And this is our TCP IP stack or simply the IP stack. So when the data is being sent from the application layer to the application layer on the receiver side, this PDU, this PDU, the name of this PDU is called a data. So between the application layer, the PDU is called a data. When the data is being sent from the sender on the transport layer and is being received on the receiver side on the transport layer, this PDU is known as a segment. Same way on the internet layer, which is our layer three, the PDU name is packet. And the name of the PDU at the lowest level, which is our link layer is called frame. So again, the data, segment, packet, and frame. Frame are at the link layer. Packets are at your internet layer or layer three. Segments are at the transport layer, while the data is on the application layer. And again, if you really want to see inside these PDUs, between sender and receiver, you can use something called a your packet analyzer or like an example like would be Wireshark. So you can run a Wireshark on one of these device and you can capture these different PDUs and you can take a look at inside these PDUs. So before we really wrap up, we need to understand one more important thing. Now we know, okay, hey, for the peer to peer communication, these layers play an important role. But when you are sending some data, the data needs to be, now we know at the link layer, we talk about bits and bytes. So that means whatever the human readable data that needs to be converted or transformed into something that we can send over a wire. And when the other side receives, it can retake that data basically from bits and bytes and convert into a human readable form. And that's where the whole, the concept of this encapsulation and 
de-encapsulation comes into the picture. So the information, like as we saw in this particular slide, when the sender was sending something to the receiver, that means they were sending some data, some information. So the information that is transmitted over a network must undergo a process of conversion at the sending as well as on the receiving end of the communication. The conversion process is known as encapsulation and de-encapsulation of a data. Why? Because when the sender is sending some data, the data was in human readable form. But when the data goes through these different layers, and especially at the link layer, this is a physical medium. So the data needs to be converted into a form that can easily be sent onto the link layer. And when the receiver receives it, we need to convert the data back into the human readable form. And that's where this whole concept of the encapsulation and de-encapsulation comes. So when your sender sends a data, so these are the different layers. So we had the application, transport, internet, and link. So on the encapsulation side, so let's, let's quickly understand. So if I have to quickly show you on the sender, there is a user data that is being sent. And if you see at each layer, when the data passes through a layer, your data is kept intact, but in front of your data, some other data is being added or appended. So let's say when it came to the application, it was only user data. Then when it came to the transport layer, we had some other HDR. HDR stands for header. And then, as you can see, HDR stands for header. And then we had a layer for header and some of the thing. So now if you take a look at the user data is sent from an application to the application layer. So let's say you were trying to send in a message from the sender to this receiver. And let's say you were using email application. So the application in this case is your email client. And that email client is sending a data to the application layer. Now we have the data available at the application layer. Now the transport layer, which is our layer four, the transport layer adds the transport layer header, which is also called, that's why you see L4, this is a layer four header. So the transport layer will add an extra header to our user data. The layer four header and the previous data becomes the data that is passed down to the internet layer. Now this is the data. This whole data from here to here is being sent to the internet layer. Now, same way at the internet layer. Now, the internet layer will add its own header, which is also called as a layer three header. The layer three header in the previous data. Now, we had this, this was the previous data. Now, the internet layer, we went ahead and added this layer three header. So, this becomes our new data. Now, the link layer. Now, when the data reaches the link layer, the link layer will also add its layer two header as well it will go ahead and add the trailer. Why trailer? So FCS, if you remember, we had talked about that the link layer has the capability of doing what? Error correction as well as detection. That's where some of these things comes into the picture. So the FCS stands for frame check sequence to make sure whatever data is being sent is being received by the other party or if there are any problem, it will uh, let you know. So it will go ahead and add that trailer and now the data is being sent onto the wire. So that's the process of encapsulation. Now when the other party on the receiving end receives the data onto the link layer, it will go ahead and start de-encapsulating. So, so when receiving a message on network, so you simply protocol stack, it will operate from the bottom to up in this case. In the case of encapsulation, it was from top to down. Now, this is going to be the case from bottom to top. So now at the link layer, so data arrives at the link layer. So the link layer will check the trailer. So trailer means it will check the FCS to see if there was any data in the error. If an error is detected, let's say that particular frame, because remember at the data link layer, those are called frame. That frame will be dropped or discarded. And the other layer may ask for the data to be simply retransmitted. Hey, if there were any data. If there was no data, let's say if the data, there was no error, then the link layer will read the layer two header. It will strip off the layer two header and it will send the remaining data to the upper layer. Then the data arrives at the internet layer. Now the internet layer will take a look at the data. It will read the layer three header. It will send the rest of the data packet to the upper layer, which is transport layer. Now the same thing happens to the transport layer. Transport layer will take a look at the layer four header. It will send the rest of the data to the application layer. And now the application layer 
press the data back to the application client. In this case, it's our email client. So this whole process of sending the data, which is called encapsulation, and on the receiving side, trying to reformat the data back into the human form is called de-encapsulation. And any time when two endpoints or when we send a data from one endpoint to the another point, this whole process happens every single time. So there is always an encapsulation happens and there is an always a de-encapsulation that happens. So again, just to recap, in this whole unit, we went through and understood a different type of host-to-host -host communication protocol, the older and the standard base. We took a look at the OSI model, the seven layers of the OSI model. Then we learned about the TCP IP stack, which is simply called as an IP stack. There are two protocols. One operates at layer four, another operates at the layer three. And then we saw the similarity between the OSI reference model and the TCP IP stack. We kind of went through the peer-to-peer -peer communication the different naming uh, structure are that is being used when the data is sent at different layers. We kind of went through the process of encapsulation and de-encapsulation. And this wraps up uh, this particular episode. I will see you guys in next episode. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in comments and I will go ahead and try to answer them for you. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye.